There we go. Um, tonight we have a guest speaker. We've got our student success coordinator, uh, Jason, joining us to talk to you, uh, not from the Hack Up State perspective, but from his day job uh, to uh, plant some seeds about the Capstone Project. We'll be doing a deeper dive into the Capstone Project next Monday, um, but Jason has a, a data portal that may kind of plant the seeds for some ideas for your Capstone. So I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Jason. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks so much, Max. I uh, really appreciate your guys' time. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to start sharing my screen. Um, can you guys see that okay? You're good. Okay. Perfect. All right. So yeah, like Max said, I'm here uh, with my day job. Feels I don't know, like a data superhero. But yeah, so here in the city of Syracuse, um, uh, Robin and I help manage the city's open data portal. So we're just going to talk to you a little bit about it. I know we don't have a ton of time, so it's going to be kind of like the the greatest hits, like uh, I don't know, like an album. Um, so yeah. So yeah. So I'm a data program manager here with the uh, city of Syracuse. I've uh, been here for just over a year, and really, you know, really enjoy it. Obviously, I'm passionate about open data, you know, learning and just kind of using code and data to really, you know, better our communities, better our, our you know, our, our neighborhoods. Um, so yeah, I'll hand it over to Robin, my colleague. Oh yeah, thank you, Jason. Uh, I hope everybody can hear me properly. I'm the data engineer to the city of Syracuse for the API team. And I've joined this gig really, uh, maybe like four or five months now. And I'm really enjoying working with the, uh, city data and being able to produce impact out of those data, building pipelines, uh, trying to show uh, meaningful visualization of those data. That's what I've been doing. And I'm happy to uh, share some insights from our data portal to you. And I'm I'm, ha I'm ready, I'll hand this over to Jason so that we can begin. Jason, you're on mute. Thank you. Too many buttons. All right. So yeah, the uh, website is just data.syr.gov. And here's just our beautiful landing page. And we'll start to kind of give you give you the tour, start to go through the highlights. If I, all right. So just kind of first, just why, why open data? Um, so really a few different reasons. One, increases transparency about how, how our government provides services. Two, it provides information about you know, demographics, spending, crime, and other health data kind of opens up the the box of like, hey, you know, I pay taxes. I don't know what the heck they do with it. You know, there are a bunch of crooks and criminals who are just stealing my hard-earned tax dollars. You know, that's my father-in-law speaking. Um, but anyway, it's so just like, hey, what do we do with it? Like, how do we, um, you know, what? how many roads have we paved? Why do we pave them? How many potholes? Um, how many crime events are happening around the city? Um, so really, it's just really interesting to see what, what is happening and really show um, the services that the city is providing. And we put this proactively online. You don't have to request this information through a freedom of information request. Uh, we just decide, hey, we're going to put it up. We're going to share it so that researchers can look at it. Um, people can learn from it, make visualizations, really kind of engage with, with that information a little more. And I will ha it, or hand it back over to Robin. Uh, yep, thank you, Jason. Uh, let me finish my part so that I can give it back to Jason again. So we know there are a lot of data uh, even in our uh, in our city Syracuse, and we have already made a lot of those data set public, which is in our data open data uh, portal in our Syracuse website. As of now, we have 83 data sets in collectively, and among those, 21 of them includes maps and locations of and how the data have been uh, visualized. Whereas uh, there are other data which are in tabular forms, uh, like 16 data are from prime data sets, and 11 of those are buzz, budget data sets. And there are many other, like uh, depending on the category of the data, like bike safety or police car officers complain and many others. So if you are interested, and I hope you will be interested because these are really uh, interesting data sets to look around, you can go to our uh, homepage, data.syr.gov. And you can find a bunch of those there. And once you're there, there you'll see a search button and find, uh, as per your interest, you can look for data and navigate through it. So going to uh, the next slide, if you if you if you're looking if you're looking through the our data set portal and if you do not find what you're trying to actually look for, and if you're really interested in it, you can let us know 
uh, and you can be a, a, a contributor to this open data that we are trying to make uh, in a Syracuse city, where there is on the website, you'll see a data set request where you can make a comment about what sort of data you want, or can, you can give a particular description. Okay, this particular thing would be really beneficial to us and for me to, for me or for my uh, group to understand how the data in our city uh, actually looks like, right? And once that is done, we'll go through our process through our data governance where the different committee has to approve it. And once it is done, which is not much of a hassle, it will go into online and you can see your data set uh, in our website. And along with it, if you want to also be notified on a monthly data set that gets updated on our portal, uh, you're happy to join it. We'll, we'll be happy to send you notification every time. We did it recently. I and my team uh, included a historical properties data set in the Syracuse, which is quite interesting. You can go through it, which is which came as a request from uh, one of our uh, one of uh, users like you. So we're happy to take your request and put the data set up. And along with it, if you see any mistakes or error, which rarely happens, but you know it's data, it can happen. Uh, please uh, feel free to notify us or ping us. We'll correct you and get it get back to you at speed. And in the uh, recently, we also started uh, a new Syracuse uh, Open Data Challenge, which we uh, which is uh, and we there was one challenge last month, and there was also winner. So this is a challenge uh, where. We provide open set, uh, open data set to you, and then you can do any sort of visualizing to, uh, with it, or build visualizing tool, or make chatbots, or website application, and try to make a meaning, get a meaning out of the data. So recently, uh, we we did the data set. The data set that we gave was uh, the public art in Syracuse. So uh, uh, Nick uh, was the winner of the uh, the data challenge, and he did. He made a really beautiful. Uh, Power. I mean, it is Tableau visualization that you can see in the in the uh, picture too, where he used what sort of materials are used for the uh, the uh, public uh, art data sets, or like which particular data sets. Uh, what is the frequency of particular art type present in certain location? So it is pretty uh, good to see those and see it and see how how data can be visualized. Uh, so it's an opportunity for you. And one big opportunity you get is you get twenty five dollar gift card. And even the bigger one is you get to sign on the uh, Syracuse City Blackboard, which I have not been able to get a chance yet. So please grab the opportunity and go for it. Uh, we'll be looking forward to you. And I'd like to hang over the show to Jason. Thank you, Jason. Awesome. Thanks so much, Robin. Cool. So yeah, so now we're just going to start to dive into a little bit of some of the different ways that the data can be explored. So um, on here, I'm just going to switch over to the data portal and looking specifically at one of the data sets. So I'm going to go to a recent one. I'll go to the historical properties that uh, Robin helped us with the auto update pipeline um, and, you know, a Python programming. Um, so we're just kind of, you know, if that's something that you're interested in, um, you know, say it's your capstone, say your idea is, I don't know, you want to be I don't know, somehow like search to see if there's any historical properties around you. So first you might want to just kind of explore it. We have it in map based form here. If you want to look at it on the table side, you just click that little table icon and then you can really just start to see. All right. We have, you know what? Just start to see like what what rows do we have? What fields do we have? Um, SBL, which just stands for section block lot number for the property, the address, um, LPSS. And then so there's just a few different things because it can be kind of overwhelming. You're like LPSS, what the heck is that? Like, I'm so glad you asked. Um, part of when we do a data set, we always try to put a data dictionary on there where we just kind of specify what these things mean. So LPSS, that stands for locally protected site. And it'll, it should say like what it means. If you find a data set that doesn't have that, like Robin mentioned, please let us know. Like, hey, this data set is a mess. I don't know what it means. Um, the older data sets don't always have data dictionaries. We've been trying to do them, you know, moving for newer ones. So there might be a couple old ones that are missing. So please feel free to let us know. So we have the definition. Um, and then if you look down here a little more, it's going to give us some information on um, these letters mean that it's a string value. If it's numbers, it's going to mean that it's an integer um, so it just kind of gives you some information about the data types here. Um, the latitude is going to be a float. So it just stuff that might not mean a lot now, but as you work with Max and get farther along in the program, these are going to really make a lot more sense. So some of this, like Max was saying, I'm just kind of planting the seeds. I love having projects made with open data, 
Um, so I just kind of want to plant the seed like, oh, yeah, there's some sort of data stuff on there. So as you're looking for capstone ideas, please, you know, check out some of this information and, you know, you know, think about like, you know, if it's something that you'd like to use on your project, if there is something you'd like to use and you're just not sure how to use it, please feel free to reach out to me. It's kind of a fun thing on a, across a both roles that it's part of my job to help kind of like train people. So we have some tutorials. I'm going to jump into one of those for a little bit, but that's kind of a, it's a unique thing about, you know, my two roles. Um, so that's one way that we can look at the data is just through that, uh, that kind of like interactive table. If you decide um, like, hey, I only really care about the ones that are, you know, listed on the register. I only want NR listed. So I'm going to, you know, I can filter it by, I'm going to go to NR eligible. There's two values. So I can kind of just select and are listed. And then I could only download those, you know, those data sets that I want. I could only filter that. And you say like, okay, that's great, Jason, but that would mean I have to download a static file. What if you update your data set next week or next month? And then the data changes. I don't want to have to keep downloading. And I would say, I'm so glad you asked that. We also, you know, the, the data portal that we use also provides API access, which I know we haven't gone to that yet. Um, anyone no, besides Max and Ariel, like what an API is, if you just kind of tell me like what the words stand for. I don't know the acronym, but I know it's like an interactive live kind of a map maybe. Okay, okay, yeah, exactly. So it's interactive. So I, the term, if I, hopefully I remember it right, application program interface, am I getting them right? All right, no, Max is nodding, sweet. Um, so, to get to that part, um, I'm going to switch back to my slide real quick, and then I'll start to go through it a little bit. Um, so to get there for the API, um, first, it's going to be, you know, we click on, I want to use this, and then it, it's kind of a pain to get there. So that's kind of why I always kind of like give myself a little cheat sheet. Um, so I'm just going to go back to that. Ba, ba, ba. So in this example, I'm going to do it for Sear City Line. Uh, ba, ba, ba. Sorry. So Sear City Line, um, C Click Fix is what we use for um, like resident requests. If you if you know a resident has a complaint about a neighbor's property or they they want a city service, um, C Click Fix is the name of the mobile application that the city uses right now. Um, so we have the the data from let's see since we started using it on here it takes a minute to load because it's a lot of data sets it's like fifty thousand some data sets um but if you wanted so this is updated daily the the long story short is it's pulled from the cyclic fix api it's put into our azure data warehouse and then our auto update script kind of grabs that information from the data warehouse and it puts it on our open data portal so it's always updated this morning like four o'clock the data is updated. Um, so if we want to use the API, we're going to go, sorry, I'll go a little slower. Um, just click on, I want to use this, and then we're going to go to view API resources. And then I'm just going to go down to the API console. And I don't know why. Jason, can you move your screen over just a little bit? Like the left part of it is kind of cut off. I see that. Yeah, I'm noticing that also. Um, Thank you for pointing that out. Okay. Um, the left part's cut off. Um, can you see it now? Like you should be able to see open like ArcGIS like, or like a view API resources here. Oh, but I see it is still cut off with the crap. Um, I'm going to go a different way. I don't know why it's doing it that way. That is annoying. Um, so ba -ba -ba -ba, I'm going to go view API resources. And then here I'm just going to click on open the API Explorer. Um, that would have been over there too. But this is stuff that you guys will learn more. I'm not trying to like teach you APIs per se. Um, but so basically what we're doing is we're calling this, you know, URL, which is where we're going we can grab the data from. Um, so say if I only want to, um, you know, I want like certain, certain data from it. Um, so there's different things like I only know because I was looking at this as I was preparing. Um, so let's see, summary is kind of how you know, the summary for that service request. So one of them is like, I'm not trying to be morbid, but roadkill is one of them. Like if somebody says like, hey, there's a dead squirrel, there's a dead possum on the road, it's logged, you can log it into C-Click Fix. Um, so say I'm 
just curious if there's like intersections that are the most dangerous for woodland animals in the city of Syracuse for my capstone project. Um, so I want to see, I just want to get information where like roadkill was reported. So I'm gonna like send that information over and then I'm going to get a response. And as long as everything works, it should send me back a JSON, which is JavaScript object notation of every event where, okay, you know, dead cat, middle street, animals, um, groundhog. So it's, that's a ton of information. You might decide, look, I don't need all of that information. I only need, like, I don't need the ID. I don't care the rating. I just want the address. And maybe I want the latitude and longitude. And I want like the date that this happened. So that'll be created at local, which you would find from the data dictionary. Um, if you're not sure what these things mean, you would do that. Um, so say if we want to revise it, we can just kind of go back and get response and then it'll change it to only give us those points that we need. So it just has, uh, bah, bah, bah. so just, you know, the, the summary address, latitude, longitude, and the date that this happened. So like I said, I, I don't know how useful that would be for a capstone, just a random thing, you know, just you can uh, separate it by whichever things you're interested in. So then, if this is, you're like, hey, this is the information I need, then this URL over here, um, we can just kind of grab it and put it in our application. And then whenever you query that URL, it's going to pull this, you know, JavaScript object notation back, which obviously it's a mess now, but Max will teach you how to sort that, how to kind of like understand and grab it. So I know I'm kind of zooming ahead a little bit, but I just kind of wanted to plant the seed at some of the things that are that are on here. And blah, blah, blah. so yeah, so that the slides just kind of go through what I did. Um, and then yeah, just the same thing that we just went through, you can grab that uh, URL. And uh, Postman is a tool that uh, Max and the team will teach you also. Um, I believe Ryan is doing that section, but it's just a tool also to test APIs and really see, okay, what parameters do I need to pass in? What do I get back? Um, and then you can kind of parse through, okay, that's an object, it returns an array to just kind of see uh, you know, to be able to, to highlight the information that you need. Sorry, I skipped past that. Um, so that's that's kind of one thing I wanted to uh, highlight. The second one, I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but I did just want to point out that we recently launched a tutorial. And by say we, I say me. It's, you know, I helped. But um, a, a random note, uh, Mel Saffold, another Cruise and Code graduate, he kind of gave me some feedback on it because I want to make sure, like, hey, does this tutorial actually work? Um, so Mel went through and he's like, yeah, it does, but you forgot to install this library. So it's kind of a, it's a fun city and cruise and code project. But anyways, this tutorial goes through and shows how to do an interactive map in React using the ArcGIS uh, library um, for JavaScript. Um, ArcGIS is the program that we use to store our open data. Um, so it just, like I said, takes you through how to make a React project with the map. Um, how to pull it in from the open data portal, how to, um, you know, so we're pulling in the data. This is uh, the bike safety map data that we have. Then it shows you how to uh, how to add the information for a little pop-up. We have the name of the street, the safety rating. And then if you want to change different colors, um, we just show how to, you know, to to change the colors based on the, the quality of the road, based on how safe it is. So we're setting it, you know, excellent is blue, poor is red. And then like, hey, how do I add a legend? That's great, but I don't know what all those colors mean. So it just shows like, hey, this is how we add a legend. And then when it's done, you should have this handy dandy React, you know, this thing. And this this top part is actually built in, in React. And if for some reason your code isn't working, we link the code to it on our GitHub right here. So you could look at the code, you can clone it. Um, and again, all stuff that I know it's, I'm kind of speaking a different language right now, but when you're ready, like, I just want you to know that this is here. Um, and if there's other tutorials that folks want, like, Hey, I would really love to learn how to access public data with blank tool. Like it's part of what I get paid to do is kind of help work on some of those tutorials. So it's really fun. I love getting requests to do that. Um, so please would love, would love feedback on that. Um, and I'm just going to switch back, but I think that was my last. Oh yeah, just uh, quick tips. Um, if you are looking at our open data portal and you wanna maybe combine a few different things, uh, just some tips that we do, um, looking for unique identifiers. Um, so say if you wanna 
you know, you want to map something, section block lot numbers in our work are more reliable to map to than addresses because addresses are kind of finicky. Um, the city, we like to spell them weird ways. So it might be Avenue instead of Ave. And it's just, it's not always clean. So I'll usually use section block lot numbers to join information. It might be a parcel ID. It might be a neighborhood that a property is in. A lot of our data sets, like say code violations or unfit properties, the data set lists what neighborhood it is. So maybe you want to do a project like, hey, which neighborhood in Syracuse has the most unfit properties? Like that's something we have our neighborhood shapefile map. Um, in the open data portal. And then we have like the code violations data set. So it's just, there's a lot of kind of building blocks um, that people can use, like ideally to kind of make cool, cool projects. Um, so this is just, like I said, the Syracuse neighborhoods um, shape file map that has the boundaries. Um, and like Robin was saying, if you do submit for series data challenge, the winner gets featured on our open data portal. Um, and, you know, under the project section, if you want to look at ideas, uh, like Ron was mentioning, that's the uh, public art visualization that uh, Nick had made using Tableau. We have some other ones made with a variety of tools, some are with ArcGIS mapping. This one, I think, was with R programming language, I believe, but I could be wrong. Uh, also Tableau, Qs Water was made in Python. Uh, Car Care for Cuse was also made in Python. The historic water main story map was built in ArcGIS mapping. So a lot of different tools that people have used with open data. You know, obviously open data being the kind of unifying, unifying theme. Um, and yeah, so that is on there. We're going to be releasing the data challenge for uh, May. It should be tomorrow if everything in our communications department goes well. The, the, the news should be out tomorrow. But either way, it's going to be a bigger data set for this month. Last month was the series Public Art, which was a smaller data set. It was only 80 rows. So we're looking for a, a beefier, beefier data set, at least 10,000 rows um, for this one. So I know I've kind of talked fast, um, but any questions or thoughts from the group? And I'll try to pull up the chat to see what people have been saying also. Um, let's see, a roadkill database. <laughs> um, uh, ba -ba -ba. Uh, can we receive this PPT? Uh, yeah, yes, yeah, absolutely. I will send this to Max to be shared with you guys. Um, so yeah, I'm, maybe I can add it to Zoom. But I'll send it to Max um, so that he can share it with you guys. Absolutely. Then we'll go into kind of capstone and, and what next steps are uh, after after the presentation. And you can definitely schedule with Jason as well if you have any follow up uh, appointment, uh, follow up questions, or want to kind of do a deeper dive in a specific data set. I'm guessing, Jason, that would be all right with you. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, please, please do. Um, yeah, if there's something you're interested in, um, you're just like, hey, I'm not sure how to get it to work with my project, I can help with some of that. And then probably we'll be leaning on Max and the TAs for some of that too. But yeah, uh, go ahead, uh, Gagan. So, um, so the challenge that you guys are gonna pause is gonna be using from the data of Syracuse, or is it gonna be like a complete new made up data that from us? Yeah, it's gonna be from um, the Syracuse Open Data Portal. We're just it sounds cheesy, but each month we focus on a different data set. So yeah, it's gonna be one a specific one for this month. It'll be one of our eighty three data sets on there. And the, the hints that I've given, it's gonna be at least ten thousand rows. There's not that many data sets with more than ten thousand data points um but yeah it's going to be one of them um and like i said i think it's i think it's fun i enjoy seeing what people submit and i know it's not a huge prize believe me i would love for because it's it's donated from other companies or groups so if somebody donated like a thousand dollars for the challenge like i would love to give it out it's just that's all that i've been donated so that's all that i have I'll all that i have God. to give <laughs> cool all right um yeah go ahead eva so i remember a couple of years ago there was a lot of talk about installing the new was it lighting grid and there was going to be a lot of data from a lot of IOT data is that has that happened uh so you know what I'm to, talking about I no know? I do know what you're talking about oh, okay. I, I know so the, the long story short is it sounds like it has been a big headache to kind of get the sensors on the light poles long story short is like national like we own the light fixtures but national grid owns the poles National Grid says, oh, by putting more sensors on the light poles, you're putting more weight on the, the poles, so you have to pay us more money. And the city's like, no, I'm not paying you more money for like a 
two pound sensor or so. But either way, we do have a staff person um, that's working on sensor data of any Sipion, I don't know how to pronounce his last name, but Vinny is focused on that. So I really do in the next six months or so hope to get some sensor data on the open data portal. Um, but it's it's kind of it's in process. Vinny just started in April. So he's got to kind of get up to speed. And a lot of the sensors just aren't hooked up, or they might be feeding one dashboard on one random desktop computer in one department. So really kind of grabbing that data in a way that's usable and able to put on the data portal. That'll be an another challenge. But yeah, hopefully in six months, uh, we can have some progress on that. Very good question. Um, yes, Blush. Um, does that mean our capstone's niche has to revolve around um, the data set or any of the topics that are available in here? No, for capstone, you guys can choose whatever you want. I just like giving this as a resource because um, a lot of, you know, a lot of capstones are focused on really really cool topics like, hey, you know, maybe food and security in Syracuse. Um, hey, like bike. I like biking. So I want to do, you know, maps of biking or, hey, I want to show like grocery stores. So it's, I just like showing like, hey, this is some of the, the data that is available. These are some of the tutorials that are out there. Um, like I mentioned, like React, uh, Tableau, Excel, Python, R. I just like showing these options. So you you can use them, you, you cannot use them. Your capstone is 100% up to you. You could do a capstone on finger painting. You know, it's, I don't know, I, um, yeah. Oh, perfect, thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, thank you guys so much for coming in. Um, we will definitely get the slides uh, posted to the students uh, so that you guys have uh, more, uh, so you guys will have them and the links in the chat with a couple other things, including Jason's Calendly in case you uh, would like to schedule with him. All right, thanks so much, everyone. Great to see you and uh, have a great night. Thanks guys. Thank you folks. So this is a, a a good a good preview of kind of where you're where we're heading, right? So we've got one left, uh, one week left of our HTML and CSS. Um, that is not what the schedule says. The schedule says we have two weeks left, but we're going to try something new this cohort. Um, today we're going to finish up Netflix. Um, if you have already finished Netflix and you uh, kind of did it on your own, by all means, you are welcome to stay in class, um, but you are excused. You do not have to sit through class because that's what we'll be focusing on for the rest of class. Um, uh, tomorrow and Wednesday, we'll be working on our portfolio website. That's going to be the first time we build a multi-page website where we not only design the home page, but then also design a project page. Um, it is not a requirement to use the, the portfolio page that we are building. However, that is the project that you'll be using with Nathan, um, who is coming in um, in two weeks. Uh, to deploy your first website on the internet, buy a domain name, get that online, all of that good stuff. So um, certainly not a requirement to use the portfolio, but it is a really good starting point um, to have something live on the internet so that when someone searches your name, you have at least a website online. Um, from there, we are going to do a dive into intro to computer science, and that's going to be our new um, module that we haven't really done before. So um, we're cutting a week of HTML and CSS to hopefully give you more exposure to computer science concepts. So instead of dumping you in the deep end uh, and saying, hey, this is JavaScript, let's hit the ground running, let's start making things, we're going to spend a week uh, going over some more concepts and identifying uh, more terms, making sure we get the definitions, kind of uh, being in a sandbox and being able to write some code and make sure that we're extracting the concepts before we transition into uh, JavaScript. And when we get into JavaScript, that's when we're going to get back to our project-based curriculum. We're going to build things um, starting with a basic calculator that adds two numbers together, all the way up to a movie theater seat app that allows you to track which seats are taken in a movie theater um, and select them and have different movies and all of that kind of stuff. So um, from there, 
uh, Ryan comes in and Ryan teaches you all about APIs. And this is where kind of Jason's um, presentation kind of starts to mesh in with our curriculum. That's when we take all of the stuff that we're learning about computer science and JavaScript with data structures and JSON and arrays and loops and all of that kind of stuff. And we mesh it in with everything that Ryan is talking about, which is, hey, this data is great, but where do we get this data from? How do we have our programs interface with someone else's uh, data? How do we pull that in and how can we use it? The reason why we have Jason come in at this point is because next week we're going to start talking about your, um, your capstones. Um, it is a requirement that you have a database for your capstone. However, it is not a requirement that you need to source someone else's data like this open data set into your database. So what I mean by that, and this will be more clear as we get in, into the curriculum, is you may have a project idea that you don't think has any database in it. Let's say that you want to make um, a recipe site and you just want to be able to click on different categories and have the recipes show up. Well, guess what? You can store those recipes right in a database. Um, or you may say, hey, you know, I want to design a garden organizer totally sourcing from previous capstone ideas there, by the way. Um, well, you could, you may want to just say, I want to allow other users to be able to comment on my garden designs. Great, you can store those garden designs in a database. Um, there's always a way to integrate a database in. Um, even if you go, I want to build a game. Okay, well, do you have to sign in in order to be able to play that game? Great, there's your database, right? There are lots of different ways to um, integrate in a database into your capstone. However, it certainly is not a requirement to use this open data set or a, a third party API, but it is something to consider. So if, if ideas are swirling in your head, that's a great starting point. We'll talk about on Monday kind of what the next steps are from there, because week five, your required, your next required project, your next required homework um, will be um, will be a wireframe for your capstone. So we'll certainly be talking about that next Monday as how you get some ideas for your capstone, what the requirements are, and then what the checkpoints are um, kind of throughout the program to say, hey, by this point in the program, you should have this much of your capstone done. Um, but in the meantime, definitely check out that open data set, right? Because you can go in that data set and uh, I'm just gonna share my screen for a second to show you what I'm thinking about. Um, so I, um, this is data.syr.gov, and I was just thinking, wouldn't it be kind of a cool project to see where fires are and see what the density of fires related to where the fire hydrants are in the city? That's a super niche idea, but that could be a really cool capstone, right, to say, hey, I'm going to go to the city and say, well, I analyzed your data set, and it turns out that this is a visualization of where there are a lot of fires, but it's far away from a fire hydrant. So if I come into this open data Syracuse and just do a search for fire, it's going to show me two different data sets that are available to me. So I can go into this fire incidents or into the Syracuse fire hydrants, and if I click into that, I'm going to get a map of where all of the fire hydrants are. Now, what you guys will be learning how to get into is the JSON of this, right? Is the that big data object um, that uh, Jason was showing you. You don't need to do that now. All you need to do is head to this site and kind of play around with some ideas and be like, hmm, I wonder if the open data portal has information about what day uh, trash pickup is in a, in a particular neighborhood. Um, Caitlin, who is one of our program managers, uh, that was her capstone all the way back in cohort one, was she realized that there's no easy way to know what day your trash pickup is on inside Syracuse city limits. And so she used this data set to build an application where you could type in your address and it would just instantly come back with, hey, your trash day is on Tuesday. Um, so 
lots of different things that you can build in here. No, you know, no requirement to use this data set or someone else's data set for your capstone. But the reason why we like to kind of plant the seed now is to just get you thinking about, hmm, what could I build? What could I uh, build in this? What can I kind of accomplish? What problems can I solve? Sometimes when you have uh, a list of data that can get some ideas flowing in terms of what you can build. Max, do you know if they have census data? I Unless don't know if they have census data um, directly on here. Um, it does look like they have the census tracts. Um, so if you pull that open, um, they have it broken down into uh, the different census tracts and um, like the different sizes of those census areas. Um, I will say that there are a lot of government organizations, not just the city of Syracuse, that are opening up data portals just like this. Mm -hmm. um, so the FDA, I happen to know, has an, a fantastic uh, <laughs> database that uh, I think it has 4 million items in their database. And it's every drug and skincare product that's ever been licensed by the FDA. And you can get all kinds of cool information about drug interactions and available dosages and stuff like that. So FDA, <laughs> government agency, has a huge database available for you. Um, I don't know how open the census is, um, but I would not be surprised if they also had an API where you could start pulling in that information as well. So we don't kind of we don't get quite to the level of being a data scientist or data analyst in our curriculum, but we certainly will be working with um, data objects in different formats and learning about how we can manipulate them and build something out of it. So Jason is available to you throughout the whole cohort. Um, he's certainly going to be the one who can like help you find the data, help you find maybe a third-party API if you've got if you've got an idea, and then it will kind of transition over to me for the one-on-ones of once you get that data set, once you have your hands on it, how do you use it? What can you build with it? What's kind of the code side of using that data? Um, that is that is all something that that I can help with in one on ones. Um, so their search uh, plush is going to be the best place to start for that. So you can go to their search and you could just say restaurants. Um, okay, maybe not restaurants. Let's try local. Let's try business. Biz. Oh, there's a data set that I know is in here, and I can't think of which one it is. Um, it may be easier to go to the open data inventory, and then this is a list of kind of every data set that's available to you. And then what you would want to do is click into that data element dictionary um, or the data dictionary and see what data is actually stored in that table um, or in that data set. So, um, I definitely saw something in the data about like local businesses. Um, and so you might be able to pull some information out of that. Um, and if you can't, that's certainly worth a um, message to Jason to be like, hey, I would hope the city has information about this. Like Eva asked a great question about the, the um the national grid uh, kind of 5G Internet of Things sensors. Um, and uh, Jason's coworker was like, oh, we have that data set. It's just not on the website yet. Well, you may be able to request that, have that emailed to you, and then you could use that data set even though it's not available here. Um, and you're certainly not limited to this data set. If you wanted to go to the census website and get information there, that's great. It doesn't have to be governmental, right? Um, we had a student in the second cohort integrate with the Google Maps API and build a walking tour app where, you know, when you're in a museum and you uh, like enter the number on like the device and hear the audio clip. Um, she built that for a uh, walking tour outside. And when you reach a certain destination, it would play a little audio clip about that location. 
Um, and, and that was integrated in with the Google Maps API. And then she built the whole um, application around how do we get the audio to play? How do you pause it? How do you play it? All of that kind of stuff. So um, Google Maps is a very popular one that, that students integrate with. Um, again, not a requirement to use a third-party API, but sometimes that third-party API can be a great foundation for you to build on top of, and we certainly encourage that. Oh, thank um, yep, someone has done a food bank one was last cohort. Um, the trash data one was Caitlin in the first cohort. Um, I will make a note by next week before we do the capstones um, to make sure that the list is updated. We do a blog post every cohort of what our students have built and kind of how the project went. Um, if you want to take a sneak peek at that, um, that is all on our medium, um, which I We'll drop a link to in our chat. Um, Max, I believe it's actually in your, it's in your canvas as well. I believe under Capstone Projects, I believe we linked them all last cohort as well. Karen okay. So they can see every project, well, not every project, but almost every project as well as the graduation videos highlighting all the Capstones. And some of them called out, you know, they got the the uh, APIs from Jason as well. So that's in there. Perfect. Um, Yes, in our um, Canvas, there should be a link to capstone requirements. That's the document that we'll be going over next Monday. But if you're chomping at the bid and really excited about learning about the project and where we're going from there, um, you can certainly uh, take a sneak peek at what we'll be covering next Monday. Um, and our Medium is great. If you don't follow us on Medium, that's definitely worth doing. Um, Medium is a uh, pretty popular blogging site, um, especially among the like the tech community and the entrepreneurial community and the self-teaching communities. Um, not to say that that's the only thing it's used for, but a Medium tends to be a, a go-to for innovators and, and kind of uh, free thinkers. Um, so if you don't have an account on Medium, it's free. Sign up, follow us there. Um, you'll see we post all of this on our social media. But um, Laura just wrote a great article on ChatGPT um, and how it how it impacts you guys as a boot camp uh, student. Um, so that was a really great piece that she just wrote. Uh, we've got advice from previous uh, boot camp graduates. This is the article I was mentioning that goes over all the different capstone. Um, uh, projects from cohort four. And then if you scroll down, you'll find some other ones in there or it's linked in that requirements doc. Um, so lots of lots of great resources there. And the reason why we do a capstone is not only so we can say, hey, we've got a project-based curriculum, but it is very, very common for you to get to an employer and the employer to have an interview question that says, well, tell me about a project that you've built. And while it's great to say, oh, well, I built this and this and this in the in the uh, program as part of our curriculum, it's also very helpful to be able to say, but this is one I built on my own. This is one that I did from start to finish, that I did my own project management on, that I went through all the steps of the software development lifecycle, that I, you know, cried over, that I did my one-on-ones during, all of that. Um, that's what your capstone is all about. You want your capstone to be something that you are passionate about. You don't want to just build something for the sake of building something. Um, so uh, definitely something to uh, definitely something to consider. Any questions about any of that before we transition into back into our Netflix? You might want to point out that some of the things they can write about on Medium can be used like you said, for the capstone, but I know certain questions I had, I wish I had written down and said, this is my process. This was the hard part. This was the easy part. Because when you get to capstone, you panic at the last five minutes going, I don't know what to write and talk about for, you know, what is it? Four to six minutes, I think. And I, I personally did a chart about the amount of times Max made me cry in different languages, but you don't have to do that. If you have it on medium, you're already ready. You're just cut, copy and pasting into your capstone speech part. And it's going to trust me when you're trying to figure out JavaScript and backend and SQL and everything else. The last thing you want to worry about is speaking for five minutes. So if you get that done now as you're going, take that extra 30 minutes if you have it a week 
and blog that out, check out other blogs, it's going to save you a lot of time in the end for the capstone. Just like a, uh, a good mental health counselor will tell you, you know, journal at the end of the day and kind of let your brain sum up everything that you're learning and kind of get it out of your brain and onto paper. Medium can be a great platform for that, right? Of, you know, I just cried over my code for the first 15 minutes and that that made me solve the problem, right? That could be a great blog post. Um, so Medium is a, a really awesome platform for um, kind of, if you are someone who likes to journal or document or write a story as you go, um, this is certainly a journey that you guys are going through and everyone's experience throughout this boot camp is unique. Um, and if you have those posts, feel free to send that to us and we can promote that through the Hack Upstate channels as well. Um, so, and, and yes, uh, Jason is available for one-on-ones, um, for data, for student success, for things that may be, um, you know, you might just need a little motivation on. Um, and you can also schedule with me. I've had some students come to me and be like, I've got five capstone ideas and I have no idea which one to work on. Um, I can certainly help you work through that in a in a one-on-one -on -one and kind of talk about um, what the unique challenges might be for each one of those projects, uh, which may help you narrow down in on which one that you want. Um, there is also not a... Um, a requirement to lock in your your capstone idea at week five which is when your first capstone uh uh check-in is or your first assignment is due for capstone we have had students certainly change their idea around that week 12 point where we start to get concerned is when students start changing their ideas at week 14 or 15 um, because that's a lot to get done um, in that period. But we'll certainly have uh, checkpoints for you throughout the program and we'll go over all of those next Monday as well. Okay, before we dive in, um, we don't have a ton of new terms this week, which is why we're not kicking off the week with a terms review. Um, we will uh, be doing that uh, certainly next week when we get into that intro to computer science. We'll be going over those terms. We'll be having pr probably a little bit more of slide structure um, next week, um, but we will definitely have time on Thursday to do a review of terms. So if you guys hear any terms this week, um, APIs is a good one that we may not have uh, predefined already. Um, definitely keep a list in your notes, and then we will compile that um, all on Thursday and, and spend some time going over any new terms that got used this week. Like I said, not a ton of them because we're just wrapping up, um, but every every time we move into a new module, there will certainly be a lot, uh, a lot of terms at the beginning um, that are new. And then as we near the end of the module, hopefully a lot of them will be repeats. With all of that said, I'm going to pass it over to Ariel. Ariel, what do you remember about week four throughout your experience through the boot camp? Do you have any words of wisdom? If it was the end of HTML, I was feeling like I was hot shit, excuse my language, and I knew what I was doing, and I was super confident, and then Max threw JavaScript at us, and I think collectively as a class, at least 10 of us messaged every TA we'd worked with and requested to drop out. We didn't know what we were doing. We panicked. Everybody was in tears. I was asking my 11-year-old to help me because he does code on the side. Like I didn't know what I was doing. And it does get better, but I, I do want to caution you, whether you're having a hard time now or whether you feel like you're on top of the world, that will change regardless, at least every four weeks through this program. Um, you really want to make sure you have your fundamentals down because JavaScript is a whole different beast and some people take to it really well and some people can't function, literally, pun intended and not you're not going to be able to do it without, this is your time to figure out your schedule. I'm going to code this many hours a night. I'm going to do this many, like, I'm going to work on this. I'm going to get this in. Because when you get to something that's harder than this, you're, you're like a chicken with your head cut off. Um, a big thing to remember is even if you're behind on assignments or you're like, I, I'm not going to lie to you, my cohort, I was really far behind on assignments for a hot minute. Max is there. He's not going to come at you for your assignments. He might say, get them in, but he will work with you 
through them. You have um, any TA on that list you can contact at any time. Some of them might tell you, hey, I'm really good at CSS, but not so much JavaScript. Why don't you try this person? Don't take it personally. That's They're better at some things. Some of you are going to come out doing full stack, and some of you are going to come out not able to do full stack. That's how this works, but you're taking all that experience. So I will tell you, um, to, to summarize, I had, I don't want to say sticker shock, but I definitely had an ego hit going into JavaScript. And then I personally went up in React. And I did great in SQL, but some of my friends that did great in JavaScript couldn't handle SQL to save their lives. It's about finding yourself right now, but the big, the biggest thing to take from this week is get your schedule down, learn time management, and figure out how much you can commit to this. Because if you can't commit to this now, you're not going to commit to it in six weeks when it gets hard. Other than that, Max, is there anything else? Do you want me to mention how many times I've cried? Or no, and... and, and... <laughs> I will say we we tend to not make students cry directly in class. It tends no, just to be me. just me. Yeah, no, it's it's not you guys all. It's just me. But I've I've been I still work with Max to this day. Um, even going through job interviews, going through programming, there's things that you you have to practice every day, whether you want to or not. I was a big proponent of, oh, I get my homework done on Friday. I don't have to touch it again until class on Monday. We came back Monday and I had no idea what I was doing. None, literally none. I didn't know who wrote the code. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know what it did. Practicing every day, uh, uploading in that GitHub, adding to your portfolio. Portfolio is a big one. I use my portfolio that I built with Max now and I just changed the design of it. Like you still use it now. It's such a basic concept, but you built that out yourself. So take some pride in that, but also learn to schedule what you need to to really get the most out of this program. And that's, that's all I got. I'll stop now, but and, yeah. And that's not, yeah. that's not just, oh, I need to find time for one-on-ones, right? That's, oh, it turns out that we are doing things so class, so fast in class, I need to go rewatch the videos. Well, even if you're watching that at 2X speed, that's still an hour and a half. You don't just magically find an hour and a half in a 24 hour day, right? Um, and so that that is certainly a challenge, right? We try to warn you guys right up front of, hey, this is a 20 plus hour a week expectation. And you may be feeling that already. You may really understand what that feels like as soon as we start getting into the JavaScript. Um, I will say that our homework assignments and our in-class assignments are very, very intentional right? They are really meant to say, hey, these are the concepts that you need to know about JavaScript specifically in a project. And the projects, just like HTML, continue to get bigger and bigger um, until we reach that movie theater one. And that's going to end up being like 350, 400 lines of code. And believe it or not, we're going to write all of those in class. But we're going to go over techniques like numbering our code with comments, right? With going through those concepts, with making sure that we're understanding it's not just a matter of getting it to work, just like it is with our HTML. It's a matter of making sure that we're understanding those concepts. So don't worry, we still got a week left of HTML and CSS. We're not, we're not diving into uh, JavaScript quite yet, but... Um, that is that is coming down the, the pipeline. Um, the other thing that I will throw out there is your homework assignments are really meant to be a check-in. That isn't just for us to be able to say, hey, we gave you a grade. We know how you're doing in class. That's a moment for you to say, hey, can I do this on my own? Can I understand this project, right? Because a lot, I think a lot of students go through class and they follow along with me and they think they're all getting it. And then they get to one of those projects and they go, they panic because they don't know where to start, right? And, and so that is a good thing to kind of don't be afraid to look ahead a little bit, right? Check out next week's homework. Make sure you read through it. That's already public. That's already live for you guys. It's not due for a couple of weeks, but that's a good opportunity to kind of line up the dominoes so that when we do get to class, when we do get to that due date, uh, you can just knock all of those dominoes down. Max, uh, one thing I did want to mention that I forgot and you brought that up and it's a really good point you are going to find through this program that you are going to want to look up YouTube tutorials or blogs. Don't do that. Don't. Just don't. It's called tutorial hell and you will get stuck and you will end up in 18 tutorials that don't match your code. 
and you will have a GitHub of 200 and something programs. And the best thing you can do is the minute you find yourself stumped, walk around, take a break for a minute, come back and message Max, myself, Caitlin, Karen, uh, Exonia, whoever is on, message someone because that's, and Max will attest to this, I got lost in tutorial hell very early on, probably what, like week eight? I got too far in. So the point that he's making is, is relevant to the fact that if you, the minute you start having problems, nobody's coming at you, come in now and ask for help now, or when it comes to that point before you're too far behind, because you will end up on an audit or, you know, whatever the, the term is now. And academic better, warning, academic warning, you will, you will get caught up. And that was, that was my main thing as you mentioned that. And that was my first thought was tutorial hell that I, I did for so many weeks. So that's now I'm done. I apologize. I will, I will caveat that with if you have found a resource or find a resource and that's helping you and you're able to use those resources and do that project and then go back to the, the required project, the homework or whatever we're doing in class. And if that's clicking for you, great. What you want to do, though, is draw that line somewhere, right? Because when you're working on that project in class and you go, oh, someone else has another snippet of code. Let me just put that in here and see if that works. That is a major red flag and something that never works, right? You Once, once you get out in the workforce, no, no employer is going to expect you to just copy and paste snippet of snippets of code. They want you to write that code. And it's one thing to say, hey, I need W3 schools. I'm going to reference something. That's totally fine. Referencing things, Googling things, that's all normal. But it's those concepts, right? We aren't just shooting for, hey, this code works or, hey, this code looks the way I want it to. This is a matter of understanding that code. And that's what we go over in class. And it is certainly concerning when we, when you come into that one-on-one -on -one and you go, well, here's all of my code, it's not working. And I'm looking at it and I'm going, well, we didn't write this code in class. So we can try to debug it, but what's concerning is there's a reason I'm teaching that project the way that I'm teaching it, right? Because I have found over five cohorts that these projects are the easiest ones to learn those concepts. Eva and, and Ariel can uh, attest, these projects have changed over the past five cohorts. We have finally gotten to the point where these projects are easier to learn from. Um, Eva went through the program in 2019 and she's putting messages in the chat, right? About, oh, this makes way more sense than when I went through the program, right? Not trying to toot my own horn or being like, oh, I'm such a great instructor, but there's no, a reason- 100%. There's a reason why we keep you on this kind of straight and narrow. And if you're finding other resources and building other projects and that's helping you, I don't want to stop you from doing that. But just watch because it, it, someone said, uh, Natasha said, YouTube quicksand. That is certainly a problem, right? Where you think this person's going to help you with understanding the concept and then you bring their concepts into our projects and then you just feel like you're in quicksand and, and really can't get anywhere. Um, so um, reach out for one-on-ones, definitely shoot messages in Slack. Slack is usually the quickest way to get uh, in touch with me. Um, I will say one major request is when you ask for help, please, 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 for the love of God, share a copy of your code when you ask the question, because there's nothing more infuriating than getting a response from me an hour later that says, show me your code. Because just like in class, um, what do I do? I say, share your screen because code does not exist in a vacuum. We need the context of the question because with coding, you may ask a question and get a totally different answer if I'm able to see your code and see where the problem is. Or sometimes I actually need to run your code to understand what the problem is. So if you're asking a question in Slack, I mean, for one-on-one, -on -one, it's no big deal. You share your code at the beginning of the session. But if you're asking me a question in Slack, please, please, please share a copy of the code. Um, Jen, I don't think there is a printable calendar. Um, however, if you, um, you can kind of, 
overlay that um, information together. So if you go to the assignments and you're in the student view, this view where it says show by date is infuriating to me. If you click into show by type, it gives you the required projects. And then all of them have the week names in the titles. We will have ones after week 12, but week 12 is like your midterm project, so to speak. Week 12 is, in my opinion, next to the capstone, the most important project throughout this entire cohort. And this is where you are going to have your make it or break it moment. Because week 12 is where your HTML collides with your CSS, that collides with your JavaScript, that collides with your uh, APIs. And if you, you may struggle on the project, you may have one-on-one -on -one help. If you get through the project and you go, you know what, I couldn't do that on my own, but with a little help, I got the concepts, I have my finished project, I can explain to someone else how that code is working. You are great. You will make it through all a full stack, make it to the end of the project. You will do up uh, to the end of the curriculum. You will do fine. But if you are struggling on week 12 and even with help, you're like, I'm really not getting this. That is a moment to kind of check in with yourself and say, hey, can I build up the momentum to really understand this? Because if you don't get week 12, that's where you need to invest. That's where you will have your summer break that is right around 4th of July. And you can take that entire week off to say, I need to get this project. I need to understand how this code is working and what every single thing is doing. And like I said, that's your HTML, your CSS, your JavaScript, and your API knowledge. So um, other than Capstone, I, I really... I wish I could take credit for that project. Ryan created that project. And once I saw students doing it, I kind of fell in love with it. Um, it is a, a really cool way to uh, get the current New York Times bestselling books out on a web page. Um, and so um, that project is really the make it or break it. You will notice, though, that we are in week four, and that is all the way out in week 12. So I think Ariel made a great point, and this certainly happens uh, to students. They don't get HTML, they don't get CSS, they're really struggling with it. And then all of a sudden they realize their brain works closer to the way JavaScript works than the way HTML works. It clicks, it happens, they get it. Ariel did great with HTML and CSS, really struggled with JavaScript, and then all of a sudden React came along, and React is if you mesh HTML with JavaScript. It's like if the two of them had a baby, that's what React is. And you actually start intermixing your JavaScript code right into your HTML code. And for some people, that's when it clicks, and they start getting all the assignments, and they can retroactively go back to the previous assignments and go, oh shit, now they make sense to me. It didn't make sense before, but now that I can see how they're working together, it makes more sense when they're independent. So it, it is a, a unique journey for everyone, but um, sorry, Jen, back to your question. All of the week numbers are in here and then all of the dates are in, that, um, in there as well. And they should be organized by due date um, in this list. So that if you wanna you know, build out your own calendar there, or kind of overlap that with the um, spreadsheet uh, for the um, YouTube videos. Um, that is also a good way. Um, where am I going to? Uh, is that on the home screen? If you go to the home screen and then the schedule, every column in here is another week number. Um, so that may be a helpful spreadsheet to kind of overlap those two um, together. Hey, Max, um, yep. I'm not sure if you caught my question there. A couple of people were asking how you want them to submit things, especially in Slack, if you want to file upload or code blocks. Um, I don't know which one's easier for you. I know I've gotten a couple in code block this week that I had to copy and paste into my VS code. But is there something, do you want them in a zip file or what do you want from them? Good question. So code blocks are personally for me, I think the easiest way. So I will show you how to do that. Um, give me one second. 
Um, fun fact, you can share, um, you can send a message to yourself in Slack. So if you ever want to play around with Slack, you can send messages to yourself. Just a, a little tip for you. Okay, so if I head into my VS Code, um, we, all of our projects will typically have two or three files in them once we get into JavaScript. Um, it is good to send all three of them. And if file uploads are easier for you, what you can do is take index.html and nope, you can't. You can right click on index.html and hit reveal in Finder. And then from here, take this file, drag it right into Slack, and you'll notice that it uh, attaches it right there for you. You would want to grab your style.css, drag that over as well. And then in this very same message, ask your question, you know, where do you get the images from mine aren't working? And just send that over. That's a perfect way to send it. If you are working in, if, if you find it easier to copy and paste, instead of just hitting Command A and Command C, and then coming over here and hitting Command V, you'll notice that when this sends, it's really ugly, right? And if you're looking at this, this is pretty easy to read, but if you're looking at it over here, it's much harder. That's because this font is what we call a monospace font. And our eyes, believe it or not, get trained at reading that font and reading code so that every letter takes up the same amount of width. So this is really hard to read. Um, and I can work with it because I can copy and paste out of it. But the much better way of doing it is if we come in here, I'm just going to delete this message. Um, instead, if we copy this whole code, when we come over into Slack, you use uh, something called the back tick. Now, I would not be surprised if you guys have never used this key on your keyboard. It is underneath the escape key. It is also known as the tilde key. It looks like a quote, but backwards. And so what you can do for a multi-line um, section of code is you're going to do three back ticks in Slack. Then you're going to paste your code in, and it's not going to look any different. Then you're going to do three closing back ticks so beneath the escape key and above the tab key. And when I hit enter on this, notice how my code sends through. It's in this monospace. This makes it much easier for me to read the code. Now, if I happen to be away from my computer when you send the question, you are more likely to get a faster response from me if it is formatted properly in Slack um, because I can e easily read this on my phone and I may be able to catch the problem without having to go to my computer. Um, so instead of just copying and pasting it in, um, you're going to want to do your three back ticks, paste in the code, your three closing back ticks and hit send. That's what will send it through in this monospace font and it makes it much easier to read. While I'm in Slack, I'm going to show you one other pro tip. Um, you can actually do inline code snippets if you want. So you can say something like, is this a closing? And then do one back tick. And then type in whatever your code is. And your closing back tick. And when you hit send on that and say something like, uh, I'm not sure you'll notice in your message that it says normal font here, and then it does a little code snippet that makes it easier to read it in line, and then uh, your next text. So it's one back tick if you're doing an inline code block, you know, just putting it in the sentence. Think about that as like a span tag is one, bit, uh, one back tick. Um, but if you do three back ticks, that's going to be your multi-line uh, code snippet. Okay, any questions about that? Don't mean to scare you with JavaScript. It's a different kind of intensity. And like I said, for some people, JavaScript is a huge relief for them because they're struggling with HTML and JavaScript is a reset. There's very, the first week or two of JavaScript, we don't need any HTML. Everything we're doing is a new syntax, a whole new language just a, a point to say, hey, if I was struggling in HTML and CSS, I can put those struggles behind me and get a little reset. 
However, as we go in our, our JavaScript, HTML starts creeping in and we start to realize that all of these concepts are building on top of each other. Okay. What we are going to do is get our code set up for today with the live share and all of that stuff. We will go on break. And when we get back, we will be diving back into finishing up our Netflix site. So um, I am going to close out of a couple things here. I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully all of this is feeling really routine for you at this point. I'm going to go to my C5 My Code. I'm going to go into my week three, and I'm going to grab my day four max flips. I'm going to hit Command C to copy that whole folder. I am then going to go back out to my My Code folder, right click New Folder, and create my Week 5. Once I have Week 5 created, I'm going to hit Command V, and that's going to paste in my D4 Max Flex. But this isn't Day 4. This is now Day 1. So I'm going to come in here and rename this to uh, day one. And you are totally right. Can you yeah, tell you I'm hungry? It, okay. it should be week four, not week five. Sorry. Week four, day one. If you see mistakes like that, please call me out like you guys just did, because that way you will save someone else a lot of confusion. So you said to duplicate week three. Uh, not duplicate week three. Go into week three, select week, uh, select day four max flips and hit command mm -hmm. C to copy it. Then okay. make a new week four folder, not week five, but week four is a new blank folder. Just right click new folder. And once that folder is open, once you're inside of it, you're going to hit command V in here, and that's going to paste in your day four from week three. From there, we're going to, uh, if you hit the enter key once, that brings you into edit mode. And then we can uh, rename that day four to the day one. Week four, day one, not week five. See, I make, an, I make a- You got me mistake. now, and I yelled at you too, and you got me. Week four, day one. If you have all of your files open on the left-hand side of your VS code, you're going to want to minimize the ones that are not today because it's going to, this is, I've had a couple students now, everything being in one week is throwing them off. Make sure you are in the week four, day one. Your and in fact- be uploaded. I don't even recommend having all of them open. I don't recommend opening your whole my code folder in VS Code because it's very easy to put something in the wrong file. Or you may be thinking that you're working in the week four folder and then you get to the end of the day and you realize that you were working in week three, day four all along. So what I recommend doing is once you have your week four, your day one created, head to VS Code. And whatever window is open, um, you're going to want to override it. So even if you have yesterday's or uh, week, th week three, day four's code open, go up to file open folder, and that's going to override whatever is in that window. And when you go into the desktop, don't just pop open the my code or the week four, go all the way down to the day one and hit open on that. And that will override anything else that you had open in that window, only open today's copy, which you'll see at the top says D1 Max Flix. That is what matters. Do you want to share a live server? I will. Live Thank yep. you. I messed my folder up. I don't know what I did. <laughs> okay. Give me one second. I'm going to get the go live working, uh, which you guys can do as well. So when you go live, this is where we left off. If it's not, that's okay. Um, and then I am also going to share the live stream. 
that you guys can join. And a reminder, oops. If you would also like a copy to see what, what's in my browser so you can open it on your own screen, you can go to the shared server section and double click on localhost. Um, reminder to everyone, before you join the live, uh, live share, you probably want to go file new window so it's not overriding the copy of code that you have open. Okay. Um, Sarah, did you need help? So I fixed it. Um, I put, I don't know what I did. I took stuff out of the Max Flix folder. I don't know what I did. And it was like separate from it. Um, I'll share my screen so you can sure. see, I guess. Um, let's go over here. You guys will have an easier time figuring out files as you go. I had a really hard time in the beginning. If you're switching from a Windows to a Mac or a PC to a Mac, it does take time, but you also can use a one-on-one -on -one with one of the beginning TAs to figure that out as well. Okay. Just wanted to put that out there. I know there's a few students I've gotten messages this week. <laughs> Scroll over a little bit for me, Sarah. You want to make this big? Um, you can use, uh, just scroll over, uh, on the right side. So just like you can scroll left and, uh, up and down with two use fingers, arrow you can keys. scroll left and right. Um, Is this what you, you want to see right here? Keys. Okay. Yeah. So everything's right here. So copy, click on day four and hit command C on that. And that's going to copy. And then we're going to go mm -hmm. back over. So if you scroll with two fingers kind of left and right, that will move you back over. Over here? Yep. Just use two <laughs> fingers left and right, just like you I'm using a mouse. So. Oh, oh, in that case, yeah, you do have to use the bottom button. <laughs> Sorry. That, okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So, so I did scroll that. back over so we can see your week three. And in your week three, or not in your week three, at that level, we want to make a week four. So right click uh, there in that column. Yep. And do new folder and do that week, oh, yeah, okay, week four. And then if you hit Command V, it's gonna paste it into that folder. But it's not day four anymore, it's day one, right? So you're gonna click on that and rename it to day one, and then that's what you're gonna wanna open in your VS Code. Thank you. No problem. Helpful for you, it's probably helpful for someone else. Um, mine doesn't let me copy and paste it into the the new folder for some reason. Like no matter what I do, it won't let me move it over there. Um, share your screen and Jen, make sure you have the rectangle app open. That's what allows snapping, and it may not be opening on startup. Okay, so we want to be doing all of our file uh, copying and pasting in Finder, not in VS Code. And Ali, you're on mute just in case you're talking to us. Sorry, freaking everything's moved around over here. So I'm trying to figure it out on this other screen, but okay. So I was so, doing it, it must have changed. This whole time I was doing it from VS Code. So like, this is the first time I'm doing it from Finder. <laughs> doing it from VS Code is a very bad idea. Um, it's doable, clearly, but causes some headaches. So now if you go day four and hit Command C on that, now when you go into week four and hit Command V, it just pastes it. Working with files in Finder is always a lot easier than working with them in VS Code. Thanks. And Kenny, I'm, I'm glad that, that you either got it or that helped you. Um, and Jen, if you, um, if you, let me make sure I can, yeah, I can tell you the right thing. Um, on, 
if you guys um, liked that rectangle snapping that we set up back in week one, where you can grab this window and just drag it and it will resize the window, if that has like magically stopped working for you um, and you want that back, it's probably because you're not using the rectangle app, which is this specific icon in the menu bar. So to get that back, you're going to hit command space which is Spotlight in a really quick way to open applications and type in REC and rectangle should pop up there. Once you have rectangle open, your snapping will come back, but if you reboot the computer, it will go back away. So in order to fix that, you can click on the little rectangle icon up in your dock. That's the rectangle with the three dots in the top left. Go down to preferences, and then in this preferences window, go to the little gear icon and set launch at login. Just go ahead and check that on. And that way, every time you turn on your computer, a rectangle will, will work for you. All right, anyone have questions or need help? The last thing we need to pull up is the Netflix screenshot, um, which I will dump in the chat just so you have something to reference as we go. This is the image that I will be referencing. And a reminder that we do have an outline. So if the outlines are a little bit easier to follow for you, if you are a text-based person instead of a visual person, that is also a good resource for you. Do you want Pop those, those open? Outline? Sorry. What's that? Do you want those in today's outline as well? Um, Just move them from four to five, or I'm sorry, yeah, three sure. to four. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. All right, let's go on break and we will be back at 725. And if anyone has questions, I'll just stick around for a couple minutes. All right. Hey, Max. So um, this week might be kind of sort of like last week. Okay. All right. I just wanted to update that. No problem. All right. Anyone need help? Go on once. Sure. Okay. I'll make this bigger. Okay, so um, your problem, I'm gonna try and, and fix it kind of a, uh, let me request remote. The problem that you have is okay. all of your images aren't in an image folder. So we're gonna kind of, we're gonna kind of hack this together to get it fixed. I'm gonna rename this as IMG. Maybe I am, is it gonna let me, come on, you can do it. What? That's weird. Why is it not letting me type? Um, can you just type in IMG there and hit enter? Okay, now we can grab this index.html and just move it over. And the same goes mm -hmm. for our, I'm guessing our style is in there as well. Yep, mm -hmm. we're going to grab this and move that over. And now you should be all set and good to go. Oh, okay. Thank you. All right, we are going to dive right on in here. So I always like to start by taking a look at our code and remembering where we left off, right? So if I expand this out a little bit, we got our top nav bar working. We got our whole left side almost done. But if I go back into my screenshot here, I can see I'm missing uh, two final things, the play and the more info. And this is really a, a good opportunity to look at this and go, all right, that, that looks pretty heavily styled, but believe it or not, that's actually pretty easy CSS for us to write from scratch. So the goal for the rest of the night is going to be to get these two buttons in, to remember uh, and build out this other section over on the right, and all four of these items are going to be really good examples of what we can build from scratch with just using our own CSS. 
then um, we're gonna, we probably won't have time for this, but a good challenge for you to take on on your own is to try and build this last row here. Try and get this text to show up and these images. I'm not gonna ask you to submit it in Canvas. I'm not gonna ask if you were able to do it, but that will be a good way for you to kind of test your own HTML skills, especially with using your rows and your calls and image tags and image fluid. Lots, lots to go on this to make it all work. But we're going to focus on kind of these four buttons for the rest of the night. And then if you guys want a little bit of practice, want a little bit of a challenge, finishing this up is not only going to be really good practice, but will make the project feel a little bit more complete so that if you cho choose to put this one in your, in your uh, portfolio, um, it looks a little bit more like the real Netflix homepage instead of just being the top section up here. Okay, so I'm gonna come over here. I'm gonna pop open my index.html. And because we're working, we're going to be working with my style sheet a lot. I'm also gonna pop that open and move it down to the bottom half of the screen. And then give me just one second here. Okay, so first things first, I have to figure out where this play button is going to go in my code. So the easiest way to do that is usually to find the content right above it and go from there. So I'm going to just scroll down in my code here. That's range. I'm going to go down until I see my paragraph. And I want to take a look at not only my paragraph here, but my other items and make sure I'm flowing in the right direction. So I'm saying, all right, I got my number two in the show today. Then I have a P tag. I've got my number two. I've got my P tag. That must mean that this next area here is going to be set up for me to put in my buttons. So to contain all of that together, I'm going to put a div in there. And I know I'm going to need some styling on those divs. So I'm going to put an ID of button row right on that. Again, I'm making sure that I'm out of my closing P tag because I'm moving down the page. I'm using a new div. And now I'm going to be in this area. And so I want to focus in on two different items, right? I've got my play button and my more info. Well, we can use a native HTML element called button. And in that button, I want the word play to show up. So I'm just going to start with that. I add in my button, I hit save, I come back over here, and my god, that is an ugly, ugly button. Now, we could actually use Bootstrap here and get a button that, that looks a lot better. It doesn't look like a browser default button. But I think this is an awesome opportunity to show how much, how far we can go with just using our own CSS. So what we're going to do is we're going to add an ID onto this. And the ID is going to be the play button. And so I'm going to come down into my CSS and go all the way down to the bottom. And I'm going to use that play ID. Why is it a pound sign? Because it's an ID up here. If it were a class, we would use a period. But because we're using an ID, we can get our play. And the first thing I notice, I always like to go visually. What's the first thing I notice about this play button that is not true over here? This is like a gray background. And in my screenshot, it's a white background with black text. So those are the first two things I'm going to work with. I'm going to say, hey, my background on that should be white. And my color should be black. Hey, so I add that in. Oh, question? Sorry. Yeah, well, real quick. Somebody asked, they said they didn't want to hold up. What is the difference between when you're doing the ID versus when you're adding more to the ID? Um, for example, it looks like. When you're adding text center, things like that, why are you adding it into the ID and not into the CSS? Because, Is that something you can cover now? Um, 
one-on-one -on -one with you. Are, are you asking when I would do something like class equals text center here, as opposed to putting text align down in the CSS? Yes. Okay. So um, it depends. So if it is pre-built in Bootstrap, we would add it as a class. However, if we're building out our own styling, we would put it down in the CSS. Let me give you a good example of that. We haven't gotten into bootstrap components yet. We will be learning them starting tomorrow. But I will give you a quick uh, preview of that because that's a, a good example. Whenever we're building with bootstrap outside of the grid system, which you will memorize over time, um, there are a ton of components that you would have to look up text center, text end, all of those in the bootstrap documentation. There is, however, um, something called a bootstrap button. And you can see that they have all of these different buttons in here, and they are all different classes. So if I wanted my button to be yellow in the background, I could take this um, class, copy it out of the documentation, come back over to my code, and paste that class in. And when I save that, I'm going to just take my ID off of it for now. When I come over here, I have that styling pre-applied for me. So there are two times that we would use a class. We use a class whenever we're making our own styling and want to apply that styling to multiple places on the site, or when Bootstrap has that styling pre-made for us and we want to just use that styling applied indirectly. So I didn't use this class here. Instead, what I did is I put an ID of play on this. Now, why didn't I do a class of ID? Because this styling, if we look at our design, is unique to this button. There's nowhere else on this page that we're reusing that styling. However, if we had other white buttons throughout the site, instead of adding an ID of play, I would add a class of white button, and then I would come down here and use the period and say white button instead of specifically targeting that ID. And there are times that we'll make that, out that, whole, play, that whole play button ID, build out half the site, and then go, oh, this button styling matches the exact same styling I've already done on my play button. I'm going to rename the ID play to a class name called white button, and then I'll be able to reuse that styling elsewhere. Does that make sense? Cool. Okay. Yep, they got it. Thank you. Great question, by the way. Keep, keep those kinds of questions coming because understanding is way more important than just having it look the way that we want it to. OK, so I've added in my background of white, my color of black. And if I take a look here, let me just blow this up so you guys can see it. I think it's applying, but it's kind of hard to tell. So what's the next thing that I notice visually? There's no border around this, this uh, button. And that seems to make it really blend in with the text better, but make it stand out from the image. So I'm going to tackle that. I'm going to come in here and I'm going to say border none. Now, you may say, Max, how do you know all of these CSS properties and values and all of that? Remember, you can always go to um, W3 schools and look it up. Or if you don't know exactly what property you're looking for, you could say something like, get rid of line around button in HTML. And something that that broad will look, bring up your Stack Overflow. And in that Stack Overflow, they're going to tell you, here are the CSS properties you may want to use to take care of that. Well, if you're like border none, OK, that did what I wanted it to. But I want to learn a little bit more about that. You can always do a search, W3 Schools CSS border. Now that you know what that exact term is that you're looking for, pop right into W3 Schools, and it's going to give you all the different values of the border style, all the different properties over here, all kinds of information. So if you're watching me, if you're coding along, if it's working and you're like, yeah, Max, but I would never know how to do that on my own, it is totally fine. I didn't even use the word border in this. And look, it took me immediately right to the first answer that I'm looking for. Okay. So now that is looking 
better. It's not looking great, but it's looking better. So I'm, I'm going to look and I'm going to say, all right, what else am I missing there? Well, if I look at my screenshot, it's rounded just ever so slightly. The play button is a, uh, the play text seems to be just a smidge thicker. And what's the most obvious thing? I've got this space on the left and right side. I've got that breathing room. So that's when we go, all right, we're spacing items out here. Are we spacing the item relative to other items? Are we trying to get other items away from it? Or are we working on spacing inside the element? Are we doing something that we want to impact the background with? That's what we're going for here. We may need margin down the road to push this button away from this button, but right now we're working on inside of it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come back in here and I'm going to say, hey, I'm going to use a font weight of 500. 500 is just a smidge over um, regular. 400 is regular font weight. 500 is not quite bold, but you're getting a little bit more bold. And then we're going to do something interesting. I want padding on all sides of this box. So I could do padding top and say five pixels. And I could say padding on the bottom and do five pixels. And I could do padding on the left, but that's a lot of code to write. What I'm going to do, instead of specifying a direction, I'm just going to say padding. And in that padding, it goes clockwise. So the first number I enter is going to be padding on the top. Then it's going to be padding on the right, padding on the bottom, and padding on the left. So it's a clock okay. that starts at 12 and works its way around. So I'm going to say, hey, I only want five pixels of padding on the top, but I want 20 pixels of padding on the right. I want five pixels of padding on the bottom, and I want, uh, and I want 20 pixels of padding over on the left. So I'm going to save that. I'm going to come back over. I'm going to take a look. And now my play button is feeling pretty good. I did forget to add in my border radius. So I'm going to add in a touch of that. Now I got my nice little rounded button there. Yeah, I and I need one more. I need my little play icon, which I think is going to bring it all together. Now we already did all of the work to bring in our material icons. And if you forgot, that's up here in this head section. In this head section, you can see we brought in the material symbols outline. That's our font. So I'm going to come back over into my material symbol, symbols, and I'm going to do a search for play. And conveniently, there's a nice play arrow here. I'm going to pop that open. I'm going to go down. We already did this step, right? We already have this in the head, so we don't need to do that again. Shannon, I'll answer that question in one second. So I grab this inserting the icon, I copy it. I go back in and I figure out where I want it to go. I want it to be inside my play button. So I'm gonna go ahead and paste that in there and hit save. Then I'm gonna go back over and now I've got my little play button in there. Now it's not lining up exactly. We could go back in and fi uh, fix that, play around with it. But for now, we're going to leave that as is. And then we can always do a styling pass at the end of uh, the night if we have some time. Because I want to move on to the next button so we get a little bit more practice with that. Um, Shannon, you were asking about how this applies. The order of it is always uh, you start at 12. So pretend that you're on a clock. You start at 12, and that's going to be your top padding. So whatever the first number is, is going to be your padding on the top. So if I say 50 here instead of, of 5, you can see that's affecting my top. From there, it's like we're going around a clock. So this number is going to be whatever my next step is at the clock. That's 3 o'clock. That's going to be my padding on the right. So I come over here, and if I uh, make that 200, you can see my padding gets applied on the right. And then we keep going there, right? 
uh, next number is going to be the bottom. So that's the, uh, the six o'clock position. And then the last one, the last number is going to be at your nine o'clock position and affect the padding over here. So if it's easier for you to remember padding top, padding right, padding bottom, padding left, that's totally fine. I could never remember the order of all of that until someone said, it's just clockwise. You start at the top of the, the div and you go around it. And then I'm like, oh, I'll always remember that now because I know, know the order of kind of going around the div in a circle or the button or whatever element that you're applying it to. Oh, Eva, that's a, a good way of learning it. It's the acronym is TROUBLE. So it's top, right, bottom, left, T-R-B-L. That's a, that's a good tip. Max. Yes. I figured out how to get the images in there. Um, it's still not showing up. I think the problem is my images aren't in the D1 Max Flicks file. Okay. Can I share with you? Yeah. Just a note, I have to stop my screen share before you can start yours. So oh, if you ever click on screen share and get an error message, just be like, dumbass, you have to stop your screen share and, and I will. And if you're scared, I have no problem saying that to him. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, this is mine. This is- You're on the right, yours. I'm in the middle. Got it. Um, so this is one of the few, well, this is what I like to do if you can be remote. Mm -hmm. I like to right click on this um, and say open in Finder or reveal in Finder. And if you can drag that window over for me. Thank you. Um, this is actually in your downloads folder. So mm -hmm. you fell into the trap of not opening the D1 Max Flix in a new folder. So if we go file open folder, we're gonna go to your week four, your day one, your max flicks. And we'll say, don't save on this. That's just the workspace. Now you've got this open in the right spot. So I'm gonna take image. And when you drag it in over here, what I think you did is say, add folder to workspace. I did. That's the trap. Don't fall for that. You wanna copy the whole folder from downloads into the max flicks folder. Okay. So if you do that, it doesn't look like it fixed it, but if we refresh, <laughs> if we go live, there are your images. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Good, job. good, good reminder for everyone that you, uh, whenever you drag something into VS Code, workspaces are the devil. They're really powerful once you get to a, a more comfortable level of coding, but for now, they're the devil. So just hit, hit that copy folder option. Okay. Keep going here. Anyone have questions? So this hopefully- I have a question. Oh yeah, go for it. <laughs> um, so my play button, mm -hmm. um, I have I have the play button in the white and then when I put the arrow in, it's to the right of the button and then the word play again. Wait, I'm sorry, say that again? The- um, the play button, I have it, it's in white, but the symbol is after it. Okay, so that is gonna be all impacted by your HTML here. So if you have the span tag and then the word play, that's gonna be different than if you have the word play and then the span tag. That answer your question? Yeah. Uh, not like, Okay, share, share your screen. Let me just take a look. It might be okay. might be one of those things that's easier for me to see. Where is it? Oh. Okay. Um. Okay. Your. Be careful here. You have your button that starts mm -hmm. here but you say it ends right there, exactly. So take that out, yep, you're on the right track, and then just put your closing button tag right after the word play. And this is where, uh, oh, 
closing. There you go. And this is where prettier will be your friend. Just hit save and it should adjust that for you. Yeah. So take a look and see that should get you what you want in the browser. Beautiful. Thank you very much. No problem. Anyone else need help? Okay. Come in here. I'm just going to try one thing quickly. Um, I don't know. No. Okay. Never mind. Ignore me. Okay. So I'm feeling good about that. Maybe your play text isn't quite lining up. That's okay. Come back to it on the final pass. Clean that up. Come back over to my screenshot. Now I've got my more info button. And this is interesting because it's similar styling, but not similar enough where I can just reuse the styling here. So first things first, I've got to figure out where does that go? Well, I want it with this button, but I don't want a button inside a button. I want a second button. But now we've got div soup going on again, right? And we got to figure out where we're going to place it. So I'm looking at this div and I click on it and that's the end of my button row. Well, I want my next button to be in the same row as this button. So I'm going to add in a comment that says end of button row. I know my next button needs to be inside this div. So I come after my button, but before that closing div, and I'm going to add in another button. And that button is going to say more info. And then I know I'm going to need to style that. So I'm going to add an ID on there that says more info. And while I'm there, I'm going to come down and I'm going to target my more info in my CSS. And there are a couple things that we can do. One, we know we don't want any border on it. We know that there should be a little bit of a border radius. Um, I need to look at the design. Okay, what's different here? The text is in white. So I need a color of white. And I probably want my font to be a little heavier there. So I'm going to do 500. I'm going to save that. And I'm going to go take a look at it. And all right, we're on the right track. But that background color isn't right. So I could just apply a, a background of dark gray to that. But if we zoom in here a little bit more. Notice that polo stick is going through the button and we can almost see that polo stick. And if we scroll over a little bit more, we can actually see parts of the dress or the, the tree in the background. So we've got a little bit of transparency on that, but it's not just transparency. There is a color as well. So instead of using the name of the color like we do on the it here, and instead of using a hex code because hex codes don't support transparency, we're going to use something we haven't used before. We're going to say background and then use something called RGBA. RGB is our red, green, blue values. They range from 0 to 255. And then what's that A? That A stands for alpha, and alpha is another design term. Um, if you're keeping a list, add alpha to the list for vocab terms. Um, alpha is another word for transparency. In other words, how see-through is that color going to be? So I'm going to say 120, 120, 120. Whenever you pick three of the same value in RGB, um, they will always be some color of gray or somewhere between the uh, white and black spectrum, basically. And I'm going to just go ahead and hit save on that and come over and look at my button. And there's my gray, but it's a little, it's, it's not, it doesn't have any transparency. So I'm going to come over and play around with that. Unlike uh, RGB, which is 0 to 255, transparency is on a 0 to 1 scale. That makes no sense to you. That's okay because we use decimal values between zero and one. So if I wanted it to be fully transparent, I would say zero. Well, that makes no sense. Fully transparent means I can't see any color. 
Well, if I want it fully opaque, I pick one and it's fully gray. Okay, this is where we have to play around. Let me try 0.5. Okay, there's my transparency. I can see the color, but that's too transparent. So the higher the value, the less transparent it will be. Let's pick point, point 0.8 maybe. Okay, that feels more right to me. Now I'm noticing two things. One, my play button has my nice padding around it and my more info is not evenly spaced. So I'm gonna go borrow my padding right up from my other button and bring it down onto this one. And the only other thing that I'm missing is my eye, which is probably bringing all of this together. So I'm gonna do a search for more info, uh, maybe just info. There's my little eye that I'm looking for. I'm gonna copy my span. I'm gonna come back over here. I'm gonna paste that in right before my text more info. I'm going to go take a look and I've got my little more info icon there and I am pretty happy with those buttons. I'm just going to zoom out, make sure that that looks okay to me and I am good to go and move on to the next one. Plush background and background color are not interchangeable. Um, there are more properties that you can use with background, um, although I would totally have to look that up. Um, CSS backgrounds, the shorthand. Um, okay, so if you only specify one value, especially if it is a color, it will assume that background means background color and automatically use that. However, there's something called background shorthand, and that's very similar to the padding shorthand that we just learned, right? Where you can apply padding around the whole way without having to use padding top, padding right, padding bottom, all of those. There's a shorthand where you can use them all together. So there is a background shorthand where if you just specify a color, it will assume to be a background color and it will use it. However, there are other values that you can use with background, like the no repeat and the uh, image positioning and the image value itself that you can use with background, the just background, but you couldn't use with background color. So you can use color, you couldn't use this shorthand with background color, but you can use the shorthand with just background. Rain, you can use RGBA with either background color or background. And Kenny, that does look like it would be the right, um, the right styling. You may be able to apply that right to the parent. No, you might need to apply it to the span. You might be right. Let's see if I do more info on the span and paste that in. Um, didn't appear to work. I would have to play around with that to get that um that vertical line to work. The oh, the button row ID. That's a good idea. Sorry, I misread your code there. There you go. That does it. Good work. While you're in there, you could also throw maybe a little margin on the right of like five pixels, uh, maybe 10. That just gives you a little bit more room. Maybe 10 is too much. Try seven. That gives you a little bit more room between the icon and the text itself. All right, anyone need help getting these buttons done? I know we're going a little fast, but hopefully this is all clicking of, yeah, it's a lot of lines of code, but we're just targeting piece by piece, getting it to look the way we want it to. All right, so now we've got our biggest battle of div soup that we've had so far.
because I come back over here and I zoom back out and I'm, before we move on, we're going to pat ourselves on the back because this was a lot to pull off. And if we look at how this looks compared to how this looks, I'm actually quite happy with that. That looks really similar. And if you guys have a Netflix account, pop open Netflix. That looks really close to a site that you guys have probably spent hours and hours on, right? That's that's pretty cool. And there's always a moment too when you're like looking at the image and it might be a little blurred or it might not quite look right. And then there's this certain like crispness with your code, right? Where you get it working and you're like, damn, I actually can do this. This is actually pretty impressive. So before we tackle Div Soup, before we move on, Pat yourself on the back. This is this is pretty good. And you guys are 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 making real websites, right? Probably the top 10 most uh viewed website in the world here. And we're we're creating it. Okay. Now we do have to tackle div soup because I'm looking at this mock-up and oh, Rain, go ahead. I could be missing something. I noticed that with the alignment of your Bridgerton on the face of the actress right there. Yep. Wait, hold on a second. Hold on this a second. is totally uh, dependent on the size of your window. So if I drag this over, you'll notice it kind of changes compared to if I drag it all the way out. Okay, never mind. So, and that's okay. That's That's the effect that we're going for here. Good question though. Okay. So now we got to tackle our div soup because I'm looking at this and I'm like, I know I got all of this in the right position. I'm still, what the heck did I do to get this over here? And how am I going to get this in the right spot? Rain, you have another question? Sorry, I lowered your hand for you and you probably re-raised it by accident. Sorry. Okay, so... I got to remember where this is at. Now, what I would do as a senior developer is go all the way up to the very beginning and look at this. And I go, all right, my div class row is here. There's a call five here. But that's really hard for me to know where that call five is. How do I visualize that? So I'm going to go back over to my code and I'm going to right click on something that I think is in this column and go down to inspect. And now I can see my Netflix, my series row. And I go, all right, hold on. Where is my series row in my code? So I'm going to come over here and I go series row. Okay, that's my Netflix and that's the word series. So I know where I'm at. I'm going to come over here and I go, all right, where is that series row in? I'm going to go all the way up to my call five and it's not pretty, but that gives me a good visualization. Hey, call five is what's getting everything over there. Well, I want to not use this area here, but I do want to get over to here. So the way I'm going to tackle that is I'm going to, um, say, all right, if I've got a five here and I've got 12 to work with, I'm going to want to leave myself two for the rating and for the replay button, right? But I need something between my five on the left and my two on the right. So if we say 12, oops, minus the five that's taken up the left, minus the two that I want on the right, that means that I've got to have five in the middle to push that two over to the right spot. If you aren't quite following along with that, give me one second and I will click in for you. So I'm gonna click on my div here. I'm gonna follow this line all the way down and here's my closing div. So I'm gonna put, I'm gonna come in there and I'm gonna do another call five and I'm not gonna put anything in it. Why not? Because this is supposed to be all empty right here. 
This is just pushing over or spacing it out. So this area in here isn't filled with anything. So this area in here is positioned correctly. So I'm going to come over here. But leaving this empty is going to confuse the hell out of me, right? I'm looking at this code and I'm like, uh, why do I have an empty call five in here? So I'm going to put myself a little note in there that says empty call spacer to push rating and replay call into right into correct space. All right. Stay with me just for one more thing. If we have, this is a five and this is a five, that means we have one call to left. But before I even attempt this button and the rating and all of that stuff, I'm gonna come back over here and just put X. Why X? X marks the spot. I wanna know if I did that right. I wanna see if my X shows up where I want it to. So I'm going to save that. I'm going to come back over here. I'm going to look at my max flicks. And I'm like, where did my X go? Well, if I resize this a little bit, my X suddenly is there. And maybe if I highlight that and drag it out over, now I can see my X was hiding in that white area up at the top. That's the danger of doing text over an image, right? Whenever we have text over a background, sometimes that text can get lost into the image, which is why we do things like the text shadow and the background color. Okay, well, we were in an interesting spot. This is positioned correctly, but only halfway. We have it positioned horizontally correctly, but not vertically correctly. And so we could do a row, but then we're gonna have a row, 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 your boat gently down the stream, sorry. We're gonna have a ton of rows. That's not really, that's not really what we want, right? There's gotta be some way to say, hey, take that X and push it down off the top of the image. That isn't triggering you quite right, Think over here. Somehow we push this down off the top. How did we do that? If I come over to my call five and look at my series row, I can look at the CSS over here and see I have a margin top of 150 pixels. If I take that and adjust that down to just say 20 pixels, we can see, hey, that number is controlling the vertical alignment there we can use that same concept over on this column. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, hey, that is going to be an ID of rating call. And then I'm gonna go to my CSS and use my rating call. And now I'm just gonna play around with it. I'm gonna put a margin on the top there of a hundred pixels just to start. And instead of fiddling around with that number in here, it's gonna be much easier to go to my inspect. Now look, my X is moving in the right direction. Where do we want this X to end up? We want it to end up by this replay and the rating. So I'm gonna come back over to my, my max flicks. I'm gonna use this tool here to go select that column. So I've got my call two. Now I see my margin top here. I'm gonna click into that value, hold down shift and use the arrow keys. And that's going to increase my margin by 10. So I'm gonna just keep going until that feels like it's in the right spot. So I'm gonna look and I, my X is lining up there. Let me go look over here. Not quite, let's go down maybe a little bit more. Um, push that down. Should kind of line up with my paragraph over here. That looks right. So that ended up being 310 pixels. So I come over here, I adjust my number to 310 and I save. And now my X looks like it's in the right spot.
I'm going to just pause there. Max? Yes. Can you go over again with inspect how you're figuring out the, um, let me reread that, sorry. How you're, how you're figuring out the spacing. Can you show and inspect which ones are the correct ones and which ones are not? When you sure. have them or after class is okay as well. I just thought this was a good time given you're talking about 310 pixels on it. Yep. So 310 feels like I pulled that number right out of my ass. I didn't. I played around with it, right? So the first thing that I do in my CSS is I just add in something that's going to be obvious just to see if my CSS is working. Because my selector could be wrong here. I could have a lowercase c up here. If nothing is happening, we've got a problem in our selector or CSS. So I put 100 in here. I come over here, and I see that has moved down a little bit. So instead of coming over here and constantly adjusting this number, saving and coming over here, I can use my inspect tool to figure it out. So what I do is I right click on that and go into inspect. That is going to bring me right to my call too. So wherever you're right clicking and hitting inspect, for example, if I do it on Bridgerton, it's going to take me to another section of the code in my inspect. So you can use this tool come over and highlight your X, and that's going to get your call to selected. Now that I've got my call to selected, you'll see my CSS is, is showing up here. It's actually saying style CSS line 79. Notice my line 79 is right here. This line 79 is lining up with my code over here. So what I'm able to do is double click on this, and then if I hit shift up, you can see that number not only goes up by 10, but it's moving my X to where I want it to go. So I'm just going to keep going until it gets to a position where I think it's where, where I, I'm, I want it to line up. And then I take that value and just type it right in here. And that is going to make it appear where I want it to. Um, yes, Natasha, it is definitely preferred to use margin and padding over creating rows. With that said, the exception to that is columns. So when you want to push content down, you want to use your margin. However, we're already using the grid system here. So it would be better to use a column spacer and then have your content over here, then it would be to have two columns and have to use padding to adjust it. But there are nine different ways that you could build this site. You could say, I hate bootstrap. I don't like the bootstrap grid. I want to use it. I want to build this using Flexbox. And you could recreate this down to the pixel using Flexbox, have totally separate code, and it would look identical in the browser compared to the compared to the, the column system that we're using. So I find the bootstrap grid columns to be easier, um, has less of a steep learning curve, but Flexbox is hands down more powerful um, if you get over that initial learning curve. And that's that's totally fine to use. Jen, what's up? Um, maybe I missed this, but it's okay to use one column like column five and then leave the rest blank and it's going to just leave that empty space. Yes. Okay. Yep. It's totally fine to have an empty div. Um, you don't see it a ton, but there's nothing wrong. It doesn't break any walls of the HTML universe or anything like so that. So when you leave those blank, does it take on the form of the other spacers and and padding and all that like the the take on the um size of the column five that you actually make that's pretty much the only thing that it's doing yes okay yep and we can prove that because if we hover over it you can see where my column five is that's spacing it out and you can see my call two is in the right spot so if you hover over the five you can see it spacing and then over the two is what's putting my x in the right spot and just to kind of show you, to prove that that's working, I can highlight this entire call five, not saying you should do this, but just showing you. And if I hit command slash, oh, it's not going to do the right thing because I've got a column in there. 
If I comment that out, you can see where my X is. My X, because it doesn't have that spacer in there, it's like, oh, you want to call two right after this call five. My X is now showing up in the wrong spot without that call five in there. So if I put that call five back in, now my X shows up at the right spot. So like even before you put the extra five and two in there, when you only had the one, it's the same thing? Yes. Okay. Yep. Yeah, theoretically, I could just, well, not theoretically, I could just make that a call. And because this is numbered and this is numbered, it's automatically going to calculate and grow to the biggest spot. But I like doing the math. Maybe I'm old school there. I would rather code it um, than let the browser figure it out. Okay, Let's get over the finish line here. I'm going to tackle the... Um, the rating. So I am going to go to, I need to figure out where that's going to show up. So I am in my rating call. We don't need X marks to spot anymore because we're not pirates all the time when we write code. And we are going to add in, um, I know I'm going to have multiple things in this call too. I know I want to get my refresh button to show up. So because of that, I'm going to add in a span with an ID of rating. And my rating on that is TVMA, according to my mockup. And then I'm just going to go out and style that. So I'm going to come over here. I'm going to head to my CSS and target my rating. And this is where we're going to reuse our background trick. Just to prove a point, I'll use background color here. And I want it to be black, which is always 0, 0, 0. But this time, I want 0.6 transparency. So there's my TV. And I'm feeling, all right, that's it's pretty good. But need a little bit of breathing room on that. So I'm going to use my clock trick again to say, hey, padding top, padding right, padding bottom padding left and make sure you spell padding right not padding all right that's looking pretty good i'm going to come over here and take a look at this and that white little line is a nice touch right it feels like it's that rating is supposed to be there so that is going to be a border but i only want that border to apply on the left side and you've seen me do 1px and black all the time. Well, we can say 2px solid white. So do a little bit thicker of a border, but only apply it to the left side. So I come back over here. You. Okay, I don't know what caused that. Sometimes refreshing the page fixes it. Okay, I'm feeling really good about that but it's kind of like floating in space. If only there was a way to get this content at the end. So I'm going to come in here and I'm going to just throw a text end in there. And if I get lucky, my rating is now showing up on the right side. Okay, I'm going to stop there. We're going to cover one concept in Netflix tomorrow, which is how do we do basic mobile responsiveness? We're going to be a lot more mobile responsive in our next project, in the portfolio, which is what we'll start tomorrow. But if someone loads this page and they're looking at this project on your portfolio, this isn't the most mobile responsive page. And this may look a little weird on a phone screen, right? This is not something that we would, this is how it would actually look on an iPhone. And we're like, ew, we do not want to be showing this project off for someone who may have pulled up my portfolio and is looking at this and they're going, and they think this is a good example of what they can build. So tomorrow at the beginning of class, we're going to tackle how do we put up a message here to say, heads up, this is only meant to be viewed on a desktop screen? 
And you may have actually seen that before in other websites, a little warning pops up. We're going to learn how we put that in. And then tomorrow we'll, we'll kick it off and spend the majority of vast majority of class working on portfolio. Little things to clean up here. If you are feeling adventurous, if you want to get a little uh, experience, a uh, little practice, if you maybe had a coffee at seven o'clock and have more energy than usual, oh, just me, sorry, projecting there a little bit, you can try and tackle using your, your rows and your columns to build out this row of, of thumbnails down at the bottom. And in the IMG folder, all of those images are in here. So if you take a look at show two, you'll see that's the, the one that I use. So use your rows, use your columns, see if you can build this out. The other thing I will tell you is if you are feeling particularly ambitious and really want to test your HTML skills, you can try and get this refresh icon to work. I will tell you that that does require Flexbox in order to get this TVMA aligned properly with this refresh icon here. So if you're looking for a challenge and you're feeling like you're getting everything going on with uh, everything that we've covered so far, check out this site called Flexbox Froggy. Flexbox Froggy, I think .com, yep is going to teach you all the different properties of how we can move content around the screen without having to use margin and fixed positioning and uh, pixels and all of that stuff. So I promise you, you will learn Flex 10 times better through Flexbox Froggy than you will if I teach it to you directly and just confuse the hell out of you. So if you are really looking for a challenge, go through Flexbox Froggy and then try and get this refresh icon to be positioned in the right spot as this TV MA. If you need help with that, and are again, looking for a challenge, this is people who are like bored out of their mind because they created this site two days ago when I first showed it to you and are just sitting here drooling. That is a great uh, little design to try your Flexbox skills. That's like, 400 level, that's like, take it, try and take it on. But if you're looking for, hey, I'm getting all this, I want to try something on my own, try and get these images to show up. Keep in mind, you're going to need rows, you're going to need columns, and you're going to need that class of IMG fluid. Um, plush, I do not have a good, I have a good video for uh, bootstrap grid. I do not have a good resource for CSS grid. Um, believe it or not, I, I deal with Flexbox whenever I have to because I hate Flexbox, but it's very powerful. And I've never taken the time to learn it like properly and use it in a project because I always fall back to the grid. CSS grid is one step beyond that of I've always been able to accomplish things with Bootstrap. And so I haven't learned CSS grid. Um, so I don't have a good resource for you there, um, but much like Flexbox, if you learn CSS grid, you unlock a whole new level of power of being able to lay out your site and, and all of that stuff. Um, haven't heard of Grid Garden, but that's something that Ariel found, so that's worth checking out. Um, so yeah, got a couple couple options there. Again, I would only attempt this refresh button if you're feeling really bored, if you've got all of this going. Um, but I would recommend everyone give this row a try. Um, work with your divs, see if you can get your images in and go from there. That is all I have for you tonight. It is 8.30, so you are welcome to peace out. However, I will stick around for the next five minutes. If you guys want to just read over your code, make sure you're understanding the concepts. I will gladly stick around for a couple minutes, see if you guys have any questions that pop up. Um, otherwise, have an awesome evening. I will see you all tomorrow for wrapping this up for the mobile responsive message, and then we'll dive into the portfolio. Um, Natasha, hold off on your GitHub. That is something Nathan will go through with you during week six, which is DevOps. 
he will go through getting GitHub set up and how you can upload your code and all of that good stuff. So that's coming down in our curriculum. Max, do you want the speaker form tonight or no? If you can, yeah. Um, and can you drop that in the C5 channel too, please, Ariel? Um, of course, where they both always go. Thank you. Um, and Man. I will post a copy of this code to my GitHub so you can reference it after class. Rain, give me one second just to upload this code and then I will come to you. Only thing I have a question on. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, never mind. I lied. I got. I figured it out. <laughs> cool. Rain, what's I going had the on? wrong. Book. Being that last week I did the um, images at the bottom, but mine was kind of like vertical versus horizontal, which yep. I have corrected. Do I need to go in and replace the images with the ones that you provided with us, or can I use the images that I used? Oh, images you use is totally fine. I'm going to kill someone because Can't this tell us account that. never wants to let me commit. Che, what's up? Um, it's better if I share my screen when I ask the question. Just a second. Go for it. I can't, can you see it? Um, yes. I was messing around with the TVMA button and I noticed whenever I use the margin bottle, like push it up, but if I go up higher, it seemed like um, it just expands the background. So I'm gonna just show you what I mean. So I don't love that your margin left is 835 um yeah it, it ended up in a different spot when we was doing the um the x marks the spots for some reason like it wasn't yeah. in the same vertical area let me request remote i think the one problem is going to impact the other so what i'm going to do is if you just like uncheck these it will unapply it and the fact that that's over there has me nervous because that means something up here isn't quite right so this call five looks like it's in the right spot but this call five certainly isn't, right? We expect this to be in here. So that is usually an issue because we have something up, either something up here that's causing the problem or something in our first call five that's causing it. Wait, on class, should I have used the X as well on class? Uh, right here, good catch, beat me to it. We've got a cl class X, not a class. So if you um, fix that in your code, check, because I think your is your code on your other monitor. Um, okay, so now so look it was at a spelling error. Yeah, that's yep. what it was. Okay, thank you. Yep. No problem. Yeah, I'm having an issue with my Mac. I know I got. I know it's somewhere in my divs in my college. I'm gonna share my screen. Yeah, go for it. So, uh, so for my play button is that. And I know it's somewhere in there. Do um, uh, you see? Uh, it just came through. Um, okay, so your call five, your call five, your call two. 
now your rating is supposed to be inside the COL2. Oh. So where we had the X marks the spot, we want to delete the X and then move the span into that. Um, where did I mess up at? Um, so, oh, and then you are missing an opening uh, arrow on that span. Oh. Oh, Command oh, Z. I don't know what that is. Huh? Command Z. Twice. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah there you go. go. Okay. Now click. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, that's right. Oh, you've got an extra arrow now on 80. Take that out. And then save. Ali, yeah, you can use the that's that's where you should get the little refresh icon from or the circle icon. Okay, so now you you're at the right spot for that. Okay. All right, I can do the rest now. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Okay, yeah. Can I just jump in real quick? Okay, wait, what's the name of the icon? Because I keep looking for it like under restart or like re I can't find the name it's under. Um refresh we refresh yeah it's refresh thank you guys no problem that's it's always annoying when you're searching for an icon and you're like oh come on they have to have that icon i'm li i'm literally sitting here like okay like restart um <laughs> new, <laughs> replay there are times that I find another icon in someone's code and I'm like, oh, that's the dumbest name you could have named that thing. Uh, Font Awesome is another great um, icon library. Uh, you have to install it similar to the way that you install um, the Google material icons. Um, but there are times that I will do a search in there and I found like uh, I've I've like done a search for one thing and then all of a sudden I find like they have all of these pirate icons and I'm like wh why like why do you have all of these themes in here or all these different I don't know it's funny when you find icons sometimes you're like that's a weird one I have a quick question yeah um if we use something that's copyrighted for example the Bridgerton font um is actually leaner bold which was created by a guy whose name i forgot i'm sorry no, no, no let's say for instance i'm doing hold on one second alexa mute let's say for instance right i use that font and you know no one actually knows the exact code unless they really looked into it could i really get in trouble so it depends. So with a lot of fonts, um, you have to be careful because just because you have the font installed on your on your computer doesn't mean you have the font installed on everyone's computer that's loading your website. And so that's what's so great about Google Fonts is that we can paste in that one link tag and it just works. What's actually under the hood of that Google Font is that font is translated into like five different font file types that different browsers need in order to make sure that that font will load in. So there's like a .ttf file extension. There's a .woff, which is like web open font face. There's a, there are a couple different ones. And it is one of the last things that browsers are very finicky about. And they'll say like, we won't use a WOFF font face. We need a TTF font file. And mm -hmm. so that's what Google Fonts does is, is it when we put in that one, it's actually loading in like all the different font files for all the different browsers. So every user who loads the page will be able to see it. Now, 
you could take that a step further and say, well, I want to buy that font and I, I want to be able to use that on my website. Well, you usually can do that. If you buy the font, some fonts can be anywhere between a couple bucks, 20 bucks, all the way up to like $500 a font face. Um, but you can buy the font. And if you have the license, you can use that anywhere in your code. And you could get a letter from the font creator that says, get off my lawn, also <laughs> known as a cease and desist order, right? Of, hey, you stole my font. And what you could do is produce your license, produce your order receipt and say, well, actually, I bought this font from you and the license says I can use it. Okay. And at that point, they would go, OK, great, no problem. Definitely. All of that is not answering your question. That's just a very in-depth legal answer. Um, the, the other answer for that is, well, you can use it locally on your computer and just never publish it. And that's that's okay, right? Copyright only becomes an issue when you publish your work, when you actually upload that. So this site, we're not going to go through how to deploy, but after we deploy your portfolio site, you may say, hey, this is a site I want to deploy. This is a site that I want to be able to show off of my, my portfolio. Um, at that point, it really depends on what font you're using. A very um, astute font creator could create a bot that would literally just search your GitHub code or search all the websites on the internet and find any code that references their particular font face. And then that bot would be able to alert them and say, hey, someone's using your font here. However, that's really going to an extreme, right? Um, what we can get away with in class is saying that this is fair use. So there's something in the copyright law. It's why SNL is allowed to parody like real shows and politicians and all of that stuff. Um, that's fair use for comedy. There's also fair use for education to say, hey, yeah, I'm using the Netflix images for the thumbnails, but it's not so I can turn a profit. It's for education. It's so it's because people are learning from it. So if net yeah, and it's in the public domain, so people know about it already. Correct. Uh, which is a whole nother area of, of copyright law of, of public domain. Um, but if Netflix came after me and said, hey, you're using our images, you posted them on YouTube under the Hack Up State channel, that's copyright. I'm able to turn around and say, well, we're not doing it for a profit and we're doing it for education. And therefore we're allowed to get away with it. Um, there are obviously limits to fair use and what you can claim for education, um, but copyright law is like a can of worms and there are attorneys that like specialize just in that thing. So I don't think you're going to be scorned off the face of the internet because you use like the exact font face. The main warning I would have for you there is just- you Don't use Disney font. <laughs> right, right. Um, I would just warn you just because it's working yeah. on your computer doesn't mean that it's going to work if someone else loads that that page on, on their computer, only because Google Fonts is doing some magic there to make sure that the font itself is actually provided to anyone who loads your site. Um, just a yes or no, and then I'm disconnecting, I'm not trying to take you one time, I'll go to sleep if you want, but... Do you think that you could show us how to go in our email, look up the code and be able to omit emails or senders that we're trying to delete when we have a lot of emails? I noticed that there are people on Fiverr who do that um, and they're paid to do that. I just feel like it'll be something very beneficial because I know there's several people with like 40,000 emails, right? Let's say, for example, they have maybe 20,000 from Reddit. And instead sure. of going one by one, I know there has to be a way we can look at the code and omit certain senders to clear out our email. I mean, I feel like you're picking up what I'm putting down and maybe not explaining it correctly. Yeah. So what you're looking for is a Gmail rule or a Gmail filter. Yeah. And so if you, I'm, it's, I mean, if you don't use Gmail, it's, it's a different step. Um, but I'm going to drop a link no, in, Gmail is good. in the chat. Um, where you can, it, it's not code specific, but Google has an interface for it. And mm -hmm. then once you create the filter, you're, they give you an option to say like, 
Do you want this to apply to only new emails coming in? Or do you want this to apply to all the, all the emails in your inbox? Um, and if you hit all in my inbox, it, it will apply that rule to it. I'm familiar with the filter. I just felt like maybe there was a way to actually go into the coding of Gmail and maybe omit it quicker. No. But, okay, well. Um, you'd have to use the Gmail API for that. And that's like, would be week like 28 of our 24 week program. Okay. You need just a little bit more experience once you get into that API. It's totally doable, but I promise you what you're trying to do would be quicker to achieve in the filter interface that exists than it would be trying to write the code for it. Thank you. Yeah. APIs have a, uh, a steep learning curve. Whenever you start using a new one, you got to get used to their documentation. You have to learn about the authentication. Um, even me, whenever I use a new API, it takes two or three days for me to start to feel comfortable, two to three full eight hour days for me to start to feel comfortable enough with it that I could apply the code that I'm writing to a production data set. Jen, what's up? Um, I just need a little bit of help trying to figure out how to get these images into this last row. Sure. Screen share. Yeah, please. Okay, so. So I have the image tag. What I was doing was dragging it over here to open it and then um, trying to take that. Obviously, I'm not doing that right. <laughs> no, you're way overcomplicating. Okay. All we need to do, same thing. It's actually going to be helpful to reference how we did it in our image up here. So like huh. the Netflix N or the top 10. All we need is the SRC tag. And then we say IMG is the name of the folder and then whatever the file name is. So we're going to do that same thing down here. We're going to say SRC equals IMG slash show one. And just be careful because these file extensions are intermixed. Mm -hmm. So the first five are JPEG and then the last one is a WebP only okay. because I was super lazy and didn't convert them. Um, and so now it shows up and we're like, okay, great. We're on the right track. I take this, I put it in here and just say show two. And what you'll notice is that they're on top. Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to do that. No, they no. are now on top of each other. So in order to fix that, I'm just going to give you the answer as a reward for sticking around this late. All we need to do, whoops, is put an image fluid on that. Okay. And that's going to make the liquid stay inside the column that we're fluiding okay. it into. And now they're the perfect size. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. No problem. Be a bonus too for anyone who watches the YouTube video and goes past the regular class time. Oh, he gave us the answer. Last call for questions. Uh, I got one. Uh, you yeah. can go. Uh, I just want to. My more info button is not uh, the same color. I know I can't find what I did, so I'm trying to get some yeah guidance. Um. Okay. So your more info. Like this. Yeah. Though. So it's probably going to be an issue with the ID, either in the CSS or um, in your HTML. So more info is there and everything looks right. So let's find your more info ID and you've got a lowercase i and oh, a capital yeah, I. Okay. Yeah. And I would bet you that's going to fix it. Yeah, there you go. It did it. Wow. All right. When it's just one line of CSS that's not applying, it it sometimes uh you know something with the the CSS property. But when it's a whole chunk of CSS that's not applying, nine times out of ten, it's going to be the selectors not lining up. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Last call. I have a question. Can you drop a link for the screenshot down in the chat? The, I completely forgot yes. to download it. Yep. 
no problem. Thank you. It's in the daily outlines, but I've got it up so I can easily. Uh, you mean the, not the image assets, like the actual thing that we're recreating, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The Netflix one. Yep. There you go. My bad. I didn't mean to cut you off. So cool. Okay. Um, I just had a question. Can I share my screen for a second? Yeah, go for it. Okay, so um, I did my pictures and they, I don't know if this is the issue, but when I go to like spread it out, why doesn't I do it? You see how like that happens on that side where like the first two is that gap between it? Like, is that like a issue within like my code or like, is it did just- you, Did you use my images? No, nope, I use my own. Maybe that's- that could be an issue where all of my images are the exact same size okay. and your images might have a little variance between them. Um, and that could be causing the problem. All right. Um, but I wouldn't lose sleep over that. Um, you could set a min height or you could set a height on all of the images and that would that should fix the problem. Um, but different size images are the bane of any developer's existence because it's so tough to line them all up. Um, so I wouldn't, I would leave it there and say, you know, that you're getting the important concept and that's what matters. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Good question. Last call going once. Going twice. Have a great night. See you guys tomorrow.